Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on an audio adventure into the world of one of my favourite novels, Jonathan Strange and Mr Norrell by Susanna Clarke. This is going to be slightly different to my usual talks, in that it's going to be a more casual ramble. Usually with my videos, uh, I try to make them quite smooth and quite narrated. They have a, a narrative quality to them. But um, I've had a suggestion sent to me by the French Whisperer, who's one of my favourite ASMR artists. And he has given me the advice that he thinks I should try recording uh, in a less formal way. And I'm not quite sure if that's going to be a good thing for me or not. <laughs> but uh, I feel it's something I should try. It's always good to challenge oneself by trying new things. So this video is something of an experiment. And we'll see how it goes. If you have a strong opinion, either way, if you feel this is a better way for me to record my talks, then please let me know. But if you prefer the usual way, then equally I'd be really grateful if you could let me know. I'm open to all possibilities, really. Uh, also, this is probably a very good time for me to be practicing uh, a slightly more casual track. Because I'm just in the middle of, well, I'm recovering from a chest infection. And so my voice probably isn't quite as smooth as it usually is. And also probably my breathing is a bit heavier, a bit more noticeable. So uh, given that, this is probably a good time to try a less smooth track recording. We'll see. Anyway, uh, I'm just going to ramble for a little bit about one of my favourite novels. I'm going to give you an overview or you could say a review of the book, the reasons why I particularly admire it. But I'm not going to describe too much of the plot, because uh, if you haven't read the book, I don't want to give you any spoilers. I'm just going to uh, talk about different facets of the book that I enjoy, and not go into too much plot detail. As usual, there are going to be some images on the accompanying video, but there aren't going to be too many, because this is a book ramble, not at all. And so, even more than with most of my other videos, this is the perfect excuse for you to close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to the magical world of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. This book, written by the novelist Susanna Clarke, was published in 2004, and it was pretty much an instant success. It won the Hugo Award for Best Novel, and the Times Award for Best Novel of the Year. It received really very good reviews across the board, and uh, it immediately hit all the bestseller lists when it was published, and it's continued to endure in its popularity. It tells the story of two magicians who are living in England at the start of the 19th century, um, a, a period known as the Regency in England, because it was a time when the king, George III, was actually very, very ill. Uh, people thought he was mad. He wasn't actually mad. He was suffering from porphyria. But uh, because he was incapacitated, his son, the Prince Regent, took over temporarily as the, uh, the head of state. And so, because he was the Prince Regent, this is known as the Regency Era. The novel is set between 1806 and 1817, and it's written as a sort of alternative history. And by that I mean that it's an historic novel. It records a time that did actually exist in real history, and many of the characters in the books are based on real people. 
There's uh, the Duke of Wellington, he features. Several politicians, Lord Castlereagh, Mr Canning, Lord Liverpool, they were actual real politicians from this era. And the book does cover several events that did actually really happen, such as the Battle of Waterloo, uh, the Spanish Peninsula campaign in the Napoleonic Wars, and of course the Regency itself, the period when George III was ill and his son was put in charge. And so um, it appears to be a straightforward historical novel, but it isn't. It's actually set in a, I suppose, a parallel universe, which is very close to our world, but not quite. And the main difference is magic exists. However, with the exception of this major difference, in all other ways, the book is pretty much a historical novel. And uh, I have to say, I'm not usually a fan of uh, that kind of writing mainly because I think it's very hard to do well. If you read a lot of uh, fiction or poetry or or history even from previous centuries, you come to realise that each century has its own rhythm. Uh, It's not so much to do with the words that are being used, it's the way those words are used, if that makes sense. Um, The speaking rhythms and the thought rhythms of uh, each generation, I suppose. But certainly when you're looking back over a large period of time, each century has its own unique rhythm and shape. And I think it's incredibly difficult for a contemporary author to mimic those rhythms in a really authentic way. Very few authors that I've read manage it. But Susanna Clark is one of the writers who can pull it off. She captures those rhythms, those Regency rhythms of language incredibly well. And uh, I do have a theory as to why I think she manages to do this so well, but I'll, I'll come on to that later. The result of this uh, really authentic historical narrative voice is that you can sink into the book and almost imagine that you're actually reading a novel that was written back in 1817. And that uh, that's a rather enchanting experience, especially given that this world that she creates, which is so similar to our own in many ways, has this extra element of magic. So within this world, magic is something which is an accepted part of English culture. And I must just say, actually, that I'm going to be referencing England and English culture quite a lot through this novel. Um, That's not something I normally do. Normally, I talk about British culture, um, because, of course, England is just one country within the Union of Great Britain. Um, But uh, the novel is very specific in the way it talks about English culture, and so that's what I'm going to be referring to. So within this English Regency culture that Susanna Clarke creates, magic is seen very much as an accepted part of that culture, and it's viewed as uh, an historical subject, really something that existed that was once very much part of England, but which has left England for whatever reason, and uh, is something that is part of the past and is no longer practised in the present. So the conceit of the novel is that an English gentleman would study magic as part of his education, the way he would study history or geography, And he might go on to become an academic in the subject of magic. He might go on to study it at university. He might become a a magical historian. But he is only a theoretical magician. Magic is a scholarly subject. It's not a practical profession. It's seen as something that has been part of, of England but is now lost. 
And people who do claim to practice magic, to be what's referred to in the book as a practical magician, that's considered to be a rather dodgy pastime. Uh, It's not the practice of a gentleman. And the accepted view when the book opens in 1806 is that people who claim to be able to do practical magic are actually charlatans and uh, confidence tricksters. They're just taking the money of gullible people because there is no magic left in, in England and so it's not possible to practice it. So this is the world in which the action of the novel is set. And the book opens with a few chapters on the learned society of York magicians who are uh, basically, they're a a group of gentlemen who, uh, you know, who have their own gentlemanly society of magic and they get together to study magic and uh, pontificate about magic. Um, But of course, they don't practice magic because that would be very disreputable. and. The book begins with a new member of the society, Mr. Segundus, coming to his first meeting and basically asking the question, why isn't practical magic done in England anymore? And uh, this puts the cat among the pigeons. It's considered to be a very ungentlemanly question and a a wrong question. And uh, Mr. Segundus is uh, pretty much vilified by several of the more pompous members of the society. However, this question sets off a chain of events which basically shape the whole book. Because uh, as a result of asking this question, and as a result of the rather critical response he gets, Mr. Segundis and his friend, Mr. Honeyfoot, go to visit a gentleman called Mr. Norrell. And Mr. Norrell uh, lives on his estate just to the northwest of York, And he is known to have a wonderful library of books about magic. And so Mr. Segundis and Mr. Honeyfoot go to ask him his opinion because they think, well, with all these wonderful books he has and all this magical knowledge that he has, maybe it's worth asking him why he thinks there's no more magic practiced in England, you know, why magic has left England. And so they go to see him and... uh, It turns out that Mr. Norrell is actually a practicing magician. He is capable of doing magic. He's a practical magician. And uh, when the York Society of Magicians learn about this, they're outraged by this uh, wild claim of Mr. Norrell's. And they challenge him to do some real magic, which he does. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what he does, because I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read the book. But uh, it's a very atmospheric and uh, incredibly enchanting chapter in the book. And uh, it's very memorable. And suffice it to say, Mr. Norrell proves beyond a doubt that he can do practical magic. And as a result of making his practical magic more public, He decides to move to London and uh, he basically goes to offer his services to the government to help fight the French using his magic because this is a time when the Napoleonic Wars have been raging for some time. And uh, Mr. Norrell thinks that he can use his magic, you know, for the cause of England to defeat the French. So he toddles off to London. Um... And he becomes quite a celebrity. He sets about trying to transform public opinion about magic. Uh, He goes out of his way to talk about modern magic, i.e. the way he practices magic, which he sees as being far more reputable than the traditional ways of practicing magic. And he wants to bring magic into good society. And tame it to a degree, make it something that seems very safe and very English. And uh, in the cause of promoting modern magic, he behaves in um, some really quite nefarious ways, or or certainly very selfish ways. Uh, He lies, he denigrates other people who practice magic, 
And he, he thinks he's doing this for the greater good, but of course, in reality, he's basically a raving narcissist. And uh, he wants to control magic. He wants to sort of keep it all for himself. And then into this world comes another magician, Jonathan Strange, who is uh, a very different character to Mr. Norrell. Mr. Norrell is, uh, uh, he's described, I think, as being in his 50s, but he appears to be much older. He's like a withered, dried up old stick. Uh, he's very nervous. Um, he's actually, if you know anything about the subject, he's a classic covert narcissist, actually. Um, and Jonathan Strange, by comparison, is, uh, he's a much younger man. He's, uh, he's very witty and charming. He has a far more open temperament. He's far more honest. But the thing he shares in common with Mr. Norrell is that he can do practical magic. And so the two of them bond over that. And Jonathan Strange becomes Mr. Norrell's pupil. And he goes on to perform great feats of magic too, um, especially in the service of the Duke of Wellington. He becomes the Duke of Wellington's magician. And he goes off first to the Spanish Peninsula. And then later on, um, there's a, a description of him and his magic at the Battle of Waterloo, which is, uh, it's a very compelling chapter. So ostensibly, the book is about these two magicians and the fact that they're so different. But what becomes apparent as the book goes on is that actually, although superficially, the two men are very different, once you scratch the surface, they're actually uh, very similar. They're both obsessed by magic, to the point where they ignore everything else. Mr. Norrell ignores matters of principle and ethics in order to pursue what he believes is the right version of magic. And Jonathan Strange, he doesn't lose his moral centre, but what he does do is he is so bent on pursuing magic that what he ignores are the things that are going on around him in his life, other than his magical studies. So uh, his wife, Arabella, the relationships he has with people, the things that are going on around him, which actually are magical, but he, he misses them because he has this sort of arrogance. And uh, as a result, both men, um, in their individual types of arrogance, uh, end up making choices which have knock-on effects, which lead to uh, very dramatic consequences. The book is, I think, a really brilliant example of a character-driven novel because it shows how just the little everyday ways, the little everyday details of our personalities and uh, how we conduct ourselves in our mundane everyday lives, how those small Details and choices are amplified and uh, become our destiny, effectively. And uh, although the book is called Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, there are actually several characters who, uh, who feature very heavily in the book. It's not just about those two. There are, in fact, multiple plot strands in the book which are woven together in the most complex and deft way by Susanna Clarke. And they all have an effect upon each other and they all come together in different ways to create different consequences. It's a really quite a complex book, but it's very well done. And uh, one of the other plot strands involves a fairy called the gentleman with the thistle down hair. You never actually get to know his real name. But uh, early on in the novel, Mr. Norrell summons this fairy to do something for him. And then, having been summoned, this fairy starts to continue to reappear with terrible consequences, with dire consequences, because this is not a, this is not a sort of Disney version of a fairy. And the gentleman with the thistle-down hair is a pretty malevolent character. He's a very dark fairy. He actually reminds me a lot of the goblins in uh, Goblin Market the poem by Christina Rossetti. In that poem, naive humans are lured to their ruin by the goblins in Goblin Market and the fabulous enchanted fruits that they sell. And um, in a similar way, the gentleman with the thistle-down hair lures hapless humans into his world of enchantment. 
Uh, but it's not an enchanted world that you would really want to end up in. There are two characters in particular who become entrapped by the gentleman in this way. Uh, one is Lady Pole, who is the wife of Sir Walter Pole, who's a politician. Unlike several of the other politicians in the book, he's not a real politician. He's a fictional character, but he's a really brilliant um, politician. And his wife, Lady Pole, through no fault of her own, is drawn into the world of the gentleman with the thistledown hair and becomes entrapped by him. But uh, for various reasons that I, I won't go into, no one realises that she's enchanted because she still exists in the ordinary everyday world. People think she's ill, but they don't realise she's enchanted. And uh, one aspect of her enchantment is that if she tries to tell anyone that she's been enchanted, she speaks gibberish. And uh, what is so interesting is that, of course, because she's a woman, and she's a woman speaking gibberish, uh, it's just assumed that she's, oh, di poor dear, she's ill, she's not well, she's going mad. She's basically not taken seriously uh, because she's not, a, you know, a great man. She's not a politician. She's not a learned gentleman. She's merely a woman. And so the fact that her behavior suddenly changes so dramatically um, and she starts speaking what appears to be nonsense is just sort of taken as a as a terrible tragedy because this poor young lady's gone mad. Um, it's not taken seriously, in effect. And the other person that the gentleman enchants, and again, it's not at all his fault, he sort of stumbles into it by accident, is Sir Walter Pole's butler, Stephen Black. And again, because he's a butler, and also because he's a black character, um, he's Sir Walter Pole's butler, but he's the son of a slave, um, all sorts of assumptions are made about him. He's taken for granted. And again, like Lady Pole, he's ignored. His plight is ignored. The fact that he's enchanted, no one really seems to realise. People are too busy leading their own lives. And the magicians, um, Mr. Norrell actually knows pretty much what's going on, but he, for his own nefarious reasons, he, he won't help. He, he won't do anything to draw attention to these enchantments. Jonathan Strange would help if he knew what was going on, he's the sort of character who, who would try to right matters. But he doesn't realise what's going on because he's so caught up in his own world of magic. He has this arrogance that he knows best and, uh, you know, he is the magical expert. And so consequently, he doesn't pay attention. He actually meets Stephen Black and he has a vision of Stephen wearing a crown, which is actually part of the enchantment of the gentleman with the thistledown hair. And Jonathan Strange sees this, but he doesn't recognise it for magic because he's just so oblivious to everyone outside of himself. He's blinded by his own obsession and his own arrogance. And so Stephen is left to kind of fend for himself as best he can. And he ends up playing a crucial role in the story. Although the book is called Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, it's absolutely as much Stephen Black's story as it is theirs. And yet no one realises just how involved he is with the magic, because they just don't see him. All they see is the colour of his skin and the fact that he's a butler. Just like with Lady Pole, all they see is the fact that she's a mere woman, and they don't look beyond so the book has some quite interesting things to say about society and society's expectations and um, the blindness that privilege can bring. Uh, another character in the book who's also a servant is Childermas, who, uh, he's actually my favourite character in the book, he's a marvellous character. He is the steward of Mr. Norrell, and I don't want to say too much about him, but he's heavily involved as well in the, in the plot he is the link, really, to uh, another major character in the book called the Raven King. He's actually, he's a historic character. He was a, a supposedly the son of a nobleman who was kidnapped by fairies in, I think, the 12th century and uh, raised 
by fairies and then he comes back to England as a young man and conquers the north of England and sets himself up as the king of the north. And it's then that English magic flourishes and you get this golden age of magic. And the Raven King rules the north of England for, um, I think it's the best part of three centuries, I can't quite remember, but it's it's a long time, it's several hundreds of years. And um, he becomes this sort of semi-historic but semi-mythical figure. There are all sorts of legends and myths about him. And he basically represents an elemental force. He, he represents magic as an elemental force which is very powerful, but is neither inherently good or inherently wicked. It's simply a power. And uh, another issue that the book delves into in a very interesting way is, you know, the nature of that power and how it's not particularly good or particularly evil in itself. It can have good or evil consequences, but it depends on how it's used. And um, the way humans choose to use power, the decisions they make, has ultimately a detrimental or a positive effect. In that respect, I I think you can view the magic in Jonathan Strange, uh, and especially magic as, as it's embodied in the figure of the Raven King, sort of in the same way that you can view nature. It's an elemental force. It can be dangerous. It can also be protective. Um, It can be uncanny. It can be comforting. It's not one particular thing in itself. It's it's how you choose to interact with it. Uh, And I, I suppose it's a really good metaphor for the internet and for social media as well. Social media is a power and it can be used in a really positive way or a really negative way, but the choice rests with the individual user. And uh, that's very much the case with magic in Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Susanna Clarke is incredibly good at conjuring magical atmospheres and uh, really uncanny moments. The book is full of very atmospheric, strange, uh, occasionally chilling moments um, when there is magic going on. She's equally good at conjuring a very different kind of world, the world of Regency society, London society, which is very smart, very polished and uh, very pedestrian as well. Um, You know, on the one hand, you have all this wild elemental magic going on in the north and all around, actually. And then on the other hand, you have all these, you know, very well-to-do ladies and gentlemen who are living their delightful lives and um, totally unaware of what's going on around them. And again, you can see that as a, as a metaphor for privilege, if you want to. But uh, Susanna Clarke conjures this world incredibly well. And uh, going back to what I was saying at the beginning of this ramble about the way she conjures that world and the incredible authenticity that her Regency narrative seems to have. I suspect this is probably because Susanna Clarke is a huge fan of Jane Austen. I don't know for certain, but I'm guessing she is. The fact that she can capture those Regency rhythms of narrative and dialogue, I think is probably because she has an in-depth knowledge of Jane Austen's writing. Um, and this is actually another reason why I love this book so much, because, um, I'm a huge fan of Austen's work and, uh, I can see the parallels in Susanna Clarke's writing with Austen. Um, for starters, the fact that she's written a book which is so character driven, um, that's something that Austen always did and, uh, If you want to hear my thoughts on that, you can always look up the Jane Austen video that I've done where I talk about the the character-driven nature of her work. Um, She also captures the Jane Austen narrative style. I think she does it really well. Um, She writes with a a very witty narrative voice uh, that is very deft and very penetrating in its observations of people. 
And that is something that I think is pure Austin. Um, she also, Susanna Clark, she also throws in a few rather fun Jane Austen Easter eggs, I suppose you'd call them these days. Um, a few sly Jane Austen references or in-jokes. You're only going to pick up on them if you really know Jane Austen's work well. But if you do, you'll spot these sly references to, uh, to Jane Austen's characters, which uh, is another, adds another layer of amusement to the book. Um, and there's also uh, at least one reference that I know of. I, I think there's only one, but there's a, there's a very funny reference towards the end of the book to um, the Brontes as well, to, uh, to Charlotte Bronte. There could be many other references to many other 19th century writers. It's just that I'm not well read enough to pick up on them. Um, I can pick up on the Austin ones and the Bronte one, but there could be many more for all I, I know, but they are a, an added delight. They add a little extra something to the story. Another thing the novel has in common with the novels of Austin is that inevitably it's been adapted uh, into a period drama for the TV. The BBC adapted it into a, into a series a few years ago, um, but I have to say I'm not a fan of it. Uh, it's pretty enough to watch, and some of the casting's are very good. Um, Mark Warren plays the gentleman with the thistle-down hair, and he's, he's fabulously sinister. He's very, very good. But um, the script is, I feel, let down by the fact that... Uh, they don't focus on those little character details that actually drive the main protagonists to do what they do. Um, they change aspects, which I suppose on paper seem quite small and not important, and they've changed them to make them more dramatic for the television, I suppose. But in reality, changing those little things has a knock-on consequence on the bigger things, and the bigger things don't seem to make so much sense to me. Um the plot doesn't hang together so well because there are these basic changes that have been made to the characters which just don't add up. And consequently, I, I feel that the TV adaptation is a bit soapy because it relies on dramatic events and what those dramatic events do to the characters rather than it being the case that it's the characters and the details of the characters that actually end up creating the dramatic events. It's sort of, it's all back to front. Nevertheless, if you enjoy period dramas, it's it's probably uh, quite an entertaining watch. It's probably better to watch, actually, if you haven't read the book, I would imagine. But the thing I would recommend far more than the TV series is Susanna Clarke's only other published book, which is The Ladies of Grace at You. And this is a collection of short stories which are set in the same universe as Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. They're set in that same alternative history timeline. And some of the stories are set in the same era as Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Uh, actually, in the title story, The Ladies of Grace of You, Jonathan Strange does actually appear as a character. Um, but some of them are set in different eras. Some of them are set in the Tudor era um, or the medieval era. And they're a fantastic collection of stories that act as a sort of really satisfying supplement to the main novel. And certainly in the case of some of the stories, they probably began life as supplements to the main novel. Because uh, one of the quirks of the novel is that it contains a lot of footnotes. Susanna Clarke has written it as though it's a history book even though it's not. Um, she's written it as a sort of fictional history. And as a result, uh, she's added lots of footnotes um, for reference. And uh, I absolutely love this aspect of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Um, but I know some people do find the footnotes irritating. I don't. I think they're great. Um, but some of them are quite long. And uh, I think probably that some of them were too long, even for Susanna Clarke. So she's taken those really long footnotes and developed them into short stories. And those stories are in The Ladies of Grace of Dew. Sadly, um, that's the only other book 
that's been published by Susanna Clarke to date. I, I did read, I think, that she's been quite ill and that that has, you know, prevented her from, from writing more, which is just such a shame because from a purely selfish perspective, uh, I'm sure there are lots of fans like me who would love there to be more books. And also it's just devastating uh, for her as an author, you know, to have spent so much time lovingly crafting this world and then not to be able to develop it further and do more with it. I, uh, it's very sad indeed. However, what I would say is, even if Susanna Clark never publishes another book, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell is such a tour de force. It's such a triumph of literature that it's really, it's one for the ages and it's going to become a classic. So even if she never writes another book, it will remain a great work of fiction for many, many generations to come. Not everybody likes it. Uh, I've lent it to various friends who I thought would enjoy it, who didn't. So um, I've kind of stopped recommending it to people now. <laughs> but uh, if you enjoy the work of Jane Austen, if you enjoy character-driven novels, and if you're enchanted by fairy tales and magic and fantasy, as I am, um, I think you should give it a go. So that concludes my ramble about Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. I am aware that it has been a real ramble, and I'd be grateful if you could let me know what you think of that, whether you prefer this more casual, rambly style, or whether you prefer the style of my other videos, which are slightly more contained and slightly more polished, I suppose. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed this talk. If you've read the book, I hope you've enjoyed my take on it. If you haven't read the book, I hope it inspires you to go and find a copy. And I want to thank you for joining me once again on this audio adventure. I hope you can join me again soon for another adventure into a different topic. And until then, thank you so much for your company. Goodbye.